Um, we're going to kick on with the session right now. We've got something really amazing lined up. I am going to um, take Chair's prerogative to hand over to the person who's going to be chairing this next session, uh, Eliza. Uh, Eliza is the campaigns officer uh, for the uh, Youth Leaders for Health project, um, uh, which um, I think you'll have seen maybe some blog posts about um, and really uh, we're really thrilled to have her on staff. She's been doing really brilliant work um, with this program, um, working with youth all over uh, Africa and, and three, uh, three different countries. Um, but she has a real depth of experience in campaigning, um, working with Oxfam for several years. Uh, and then also, and really importantly, um, in her spare time, uh, uh, well, and I don't know where she finds it, but she's the co-founder of Diasporic Development. Um, which is a community of black professionals interested in and or working in global development charity in the third sector. Um, really, really uh, important group. And Eliza, so pleased that you're able to chair the session just now. I'm going to hand over to you to, uh, to run it from here. Thank you so much, Aaron. Honestly, um, your introduction is really lovely. And um, yes, that's me. I am the campaigns officer for the Youth Leaders for Health uh, project at Results UK and um, it's such an honour to be on the call and to be with all of the um, Results UK um, campaigners and champions because um, as Aaron said I came from Oxfam and I used to be in the government relations team and when I would go into parliament or I would go to party conferences I would always hear about results UK campaigners, champions, you know, holding MPs to account, putting their asks forward, and just really being amazing advocates for ending global poverty um, around the world. And so it's such an honour to be part of Results UK, but also to be at this conference today, speaking to all of you and chairing this session. So thank you for having me. Um, so, this year, 2020, what can, what can I say? It's been a really weird one for campaigners across the world. We have, you know, all our normal ways of working have been completely upended. So in this session, we're just going to take an overview and learn insights and experiences from around the world. But before we get started, just a few bits of housekeeping. As we've already covered, muting yourselves during this session so that um, we can get to all the juicy questions at the end during the question and answer um, bits of the segment uh, of the ses session. And if you do have any questions, any burning questions that you don't want to forget during the course of the session, please pop them in the chat box. I will be keeping an eye on them and we can get to them during the Q&A session. So don't forget them put them in the chat box and they'll be safe there until the Q&A session. Um, so that's housekeeping and on to the fun stuff or the interesting stuff where we can talk about what it means to be campaigning during this COVID reality and how much things have changed. So as, I, as Aaron mentioned in his introduction, I am the campaigns officer for the Youth Leaders for Health project. And we work in three African countries. We work in Ghana, Sierra Leone, and Tanzania. We're working with 25 amazing young people who are campaigning not only to eradicate malaria, but also to strengthen health systems, both at a national level, a regional level, and a global level. And like everybody else, we had big plans, big hopes, especially because it's 2020. Um, we are, what, 10 years away from the end of the Sustainable Development Goals. So there's all to, like, there's everything to play for. And there were so many amazing advocacy moments that we had planned during the course of 2020, such as um, the Commonwealth Heads of Government, where malaria was going to be one of the priority um, um, discussions amongst um, heads of state. Um, we had World Malaria Day. We had so many things already geared up. We had 
25 amazing young people already with their advocacy skills and their passion and their tenacity to go and hold their politicians and their stakeholders and their decision makers to account and then COVID hit in March and everything has been completely um well it's been an interesting turn of events to say the least and I'm sure that everybody on the call can completely resonate because we've not been able to use our traditional means of meeting with MPs with uh, decision makers but that doesn't mean that advocacy and campaigning has come to an end um, if in fact this is the moment that we've been pushing harder because we all recognize that not only is it important for us to have um for governments to um protect those most vulnerable during this pandemic but it's important for us to have strong and resilient public services if we are to not only combat this pandemic but ensure that people who are vulnerable to other diseases that are still persistent such as tb and malaria aren't left behind and because we know covid doesn't know any borders but it affects those most vulnerable most we have to as campaigners keep on pushing so in this session we're going to hear from two amazing campaigners who in the face of it all have kept on campaigning and we're going to learn about what their experience has been so we can share insights experiences and remember that it we're not alone and we all we've all had to adjust so how can we continue adjusting our means of campaigning and advocating for the things for ending global poverty as much as possible so we have um we have Mwaniki, who's the campaigns manager of Kanko. She, as Aaron mentioned before, is a well-experienced um, campaigner who I'm really looking forward to hearing um, from. She has a wealth of experience campaigning on HIV and TB um, and has worked for various agencies, including um, the UN um, and has sat on um, the TB and HIV intercoordination committees. So we'll be hearing from Rehab first, and we also have Rhoda Intimawusu, who is one of the youth leaders for health in Ghana, and she is um, she is one of our youth leaders who has been going out into the community and working with the community in the wake of COVID-19 cropping up. She is currently a microbiology student at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana and she is specializing um, in um, vector-borne and infectious diseases. So it would be great to hear from both of them and I will then hand over to Rehab first to share her remarks, then Rhoda, and then we'll go into the Q&A session. So without further ado, I'd love to hear from Rehab. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eliza. I hope I'm audible. Um, uh, thank you. So I would like to ask Navi to share my screen. I only have like two slides to explain some of the campaign. And just to add on to what Eliza said, that COVID came at a point uh, we didn't expect, like in Africa, we thought these are issues that happen in the North, in, in uh, South Asia. But um, next slide, please. So Kanko is a local organization and we also have partners globally. That's why we work very closely with Resort UK and other partners in other continent. Uh, next. So when COVID, um, Next slide, please. So when COVID happened, it happened when we were in the middle of implementing the Global Fund grant. Now, why is Global Fund important to us? Global Fund has a lot of support from quite a number of governments, including United Kingdom. We started experiencing a few stockouts like Septrin. Septrin is a prophylaxis for anyone who turns positive and do not want does not want to be initiated on treatment, they are put on septrin so that they prevent, uh, it prevents infectious diseases like uh, tuberculosis, uh, pneumonia, you know, it prevents um, the co-infection bit. 
So, as if said, we realize now we are having stockout of septrin, we were having stockout of nevirapine syrup for children. And what happens is that uh, any child who is born by a HIV positive mother, they are quickly put on nevirapine for a period of nine months. So when this happened, civil society wrote to, at the national level, civil society wrote to the national leaders, including the Minister of Health. We said we are experiencing this challenge. We know we have adequate funding from uh, Global Fund, which UK puts a lot of funding, including US. And we also engaged our grassroots at the local level. So we need to note that uh, in Kenya, health is devolved. We have the national government, which has policy and national, uh, international agreements like Global Fund. But at the devolved function, which is most of it, we're also experiencing the stockouts. So our grassroots wrote letters to the members of parliament and asked them to pressure national government, the Minister of Health, to explain why we are having stockouts of nevirapine, of septrin, and peroximide, which is for first-line TB drug. And we got a response in April, and uh, what the, so the first, the letter you see on the right of the screen with a letterhead of Minister of Health is a second letter because we have kept pressuring the ministry to say we need septrin, we need nevirapine for our children, and we need peroximide for TB because we will lose the fight even if we concentrate so much on COVID-19. And what I want to say is that we are lucky as a country, we, the, the, the incidences have started going down. We're only getting like 100 cases per day, and sometimes we don't have any deaths reported, so which is good for us. But COVID-19 has come at a point now the government is uh, losing focus or not putting so much um, focus on some of the issues we'll be having like tuberculosis. So that is a letter that came beginning of this month, 1st September, and the minister, the permanent secretary, who is the accounting officer in the Minister of Health, asked the, the, the procurement agency, government agency, to explain when the commodities will be back. In, in addition to what we have done writing letters, we have also engaged media. Uh, we also have a media grassroots movement in Kenya in quite a number of counties. And the first top uh, left side, you have a newspaper article that also appeared in September where you can see the headline is, lives at risk as public hospitals run out of ARVs. So we are still pressuring because we still don't have the drugs. We are getting people sharing drugs. What that means is that if my drugs uh, end within 20 days, then where will I get the other 10 days? Yeah. And so even last week, uh, no, this week we had a Twitter chat on septic stockout. So depending on what is pressuring so much, we do have Twitter, social media. We want to say that Kenya is one of the second largest country. I mean, the second country that has a very big follow up, follow, follower of um, social media like twitter facebook and we get the attention even of the president on our twitter chat so i want to say we have not yet gotten there we are still putting up the campaign we need to have treatment because we know we have a lot of money for global fund and what has happened every year we do not have um, a absorption we don't absorb all the money some money usually goes back but why it's important for grassroots in UK is that we want to tell you that we appreciate the support of governments like UK in ensuring people from developed countries are able to access treatment at no cost. So UK pays for it, but as as recipients of developing countries, we access treatment at no cost, which is very good because it is improving uh, the quality of life of many of our Kenyans uh, who need these commodities. Next. And that is it. I would want to open it up for questions. It was very brief because I want to be asked questions and I support what we have done. We are doing so much on campaigns, but this specifically is on grassroots and tuberculosis and the role, the link we have between developing countries and developed countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rehab. I am. I'm writing down questions. 
Um, and I can't wait to use my prerogative as chair to ask in a bit, but we'll have um, Rhoda first also share her experiences before we get to the Q&A session. Thank you. Rhoda, you're, you're on mute. Sorry, you're still yeah. on mute. Okay. So, hello, I'm Rhoda. And before I begin, I would like to say a big thank you to the organizers of this conference and to Resort UK and to everyone on this conference for this opportunity. So I want to begin my with the storytelling. I want it to flow. So how my advocacy started, my motivation, then we can go on to the challenges. So I live in a community where malaria and typhoid fever is very prevalent. And the worst part of it all was when a relative of mine, who was then a young girl, six years old, had malaria. And it was so critical to the extent that she had to be rushed to the hospital. And upon arriving, it, it took us long hours before we were being attended to. So the question is, why should we take long hours in the hospital before we, become, we, we are being attended to? It all boils down to our health system. Um, our facilities and our equipment are all under pressure. And moreover, the doctor to patient ratio is very, very low. And this led to her even losing her life at the end of the day. So then I decided to be the voice of my community for people to know what is actually happening on the ground. And so then I started with this advocacy and had this opportunity to be part of Youth Leaders for Health to advocate more on malaria. And what is our main motive or our main goals is that malaria funding to be increased by 20%. And I know, I know that when this resources or the funding is being increased, then we can have reduced cases. When we go to our district, for instance, we have a whole lot of malaria cases. And even now, due to the pandemic, it's even increased more. As from my biography, the study that we conducted in my community showed that there are a whole lot of malaria cases. And why should it be so? Because of the pandemic that we are in, people are afraid to go to the hospitals because they have the fear that when they go to the hospital, they would also get infected with the virus. And so what happens now is even in the, in, in, in the pandemic, what, what should we do? Should we halt campaigning or should we continue with campaigning? Of course, campaigning has to continue. And so what are the strategies that we took in place to campaign? Then we had to go online. Everything had to go virtual because we had to take into consideration the safety protocols in order not to be infected. So then all our meetings and our campaigns had to go online where we had to get social handles of big people in power, of key holders and of stakeholders and people who have the authority to influence or to effect change. And so we started with our campaigning, with social media platform, and even with emails, pushing harder and harder. It's difficult, you know, it's different when you have this face-to-face -face interaction. And let me chip this in. Before COVID-19, we had the opportunity to meet stakeholders. I had the opportunity to meet my regional director of health, to meet the mayor of my city. And upon hearing the story and of knowing what is happening in my community, he decided to take part in this campaign. But then with the effects or with COVID-19, all our meetings have to be halted. And so it has really become difficult. But what I want to say is even in this time of difficulty, in this, in this era of difficulty, we still have to let our voices be heard. And what do we do? We use the online. We use the social media platform. It will be very difficult. But then it gives you a broader scope to reach out to a lot of people because it was more of community engagement in my community. But now I can go out all the world and effect that change for people to hear our voices. So this is one of the crucial parts and crucial moments for us. But then our messages are going. And hopefully, I know when it's over, things will resume back to normal. But then, as I said, the government is doing a lot. And then we are trying to continue with the mass distribution of the ITN and also to continue with the residual spraying, the indoor residual spraying, though they are keeping in place the safety protocols. So this is the new change and the new era and the new normal, but then we are keeping to it. So thank you very much. And hope to have a lot of questions so that I can make it more explicit and explain myself more better. Yeah, thank you. Honestly, Rhoda, I was completely moved by your how you framed it. And it just 
really it just encapsulates exactly why we all do what we do and why we all are campaigners because this isn't you know an academic exercise this isn't something that is distant or removed this is people's real lives and everything we can do to affect change to ensure that more lives aren't lost in the process because of lack of funding because of you know um inadequate resources to address some of these problems yeah you've just reminded me why why we get up and we do what we do so thank you so much Rhoda for your your brilliant storytelling and sharing your experiences um as speaker I've I've kept an eye on the chat and I would just like please add your questions if you'd like but before before that I'm just going to abuse my privilege a bit and ask a couple of questions because both of you um really focused on the the, the positives of um, social media and online campaigning and trying to um, contact stakeholders or decision makers um, in that way because that's literally the only way we've had um, and I know Rahab has had positive experiences with that because of the strong social media um, presence of um, politicians and um, decision makers in Kenya and but I'm not sure how active on social media um, politicians and decision makers are in Ghana so if you could both kind of give us a bit more insight into those things that would be great um, especially because that's what we are using as well and it's in some ways social media is quite a leveler so it's, it'll be good to hear about your different experiences what you've learned and any tips you could give to the campaigners on the call so I would ask um, Rahab to go first and then Rhoda. Okay, thank you so much. So for us to succeed in social media campaign, it comes with a lot of planning offline with just a few people. We could have like 20 people, key people, and we input in uh, a few of uh, social media influencers. They don't have to be celebrities, but in our sector, we have people who have a lot of following and if we join this following and this following we can get many people then what we also plan is we target we have to block timing you saw like the twitter chat had two hours timing just before prime time news at 1 pm that's when we block and make sure that we are very active and then we have a whatsapp group with everybody we agreed we agree on a twitter handle we agree on whom we are tagging and the president is usually one of them. Why the president is one of the people we tag in health is because you have the universal health coverage agenda, which is very close to him. And you see, when you have issues like stockouts happening, I mean, we're not doing anything. I mean, at the end of the day, we'll not even attain a quarter of the UHC target. So we do a lot of planning offline. We do WhatsApp. We engage, um, we form our WhatsApp, and then we keep throwing... Uh, information to quite a number of whatsapp for high level people but when we come online it is online until we even tag media house until people tell us like um, we have had there's no septrin is it true and you can find the government coming out in a statement and saying we know there's no septrin in a few months it's going to be airlifted social media is key because we also want to avoid um, crowds and people being reinfected, I mean, it will be the purpose if more people are infected with COVID-19, but it has really worked very well for us. And then we have a very strong internet connectivity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Rhoda, you're on mute, sorry. Yes. So, with the Youth Leaders for Health, we target key moments. I remember for the World Malaria Day, I'm giving an instance so that I can build on my points for people to really understand what we usually do. So a key moment like World Malaria Day, we had a timing that for this day, from this time to this time, we are tweeting, all of us. And it's not like an individual thing. When I tweet, then someone retweets. So we continue and we have key people that we are tweeting. We are sending these messages across. And the number, the number, the, the, the higher the number of tweets, that is when our messages are being pushed forward. It makes people notice that these messages and these campaigns are very important, so they have to be noticed. And I remember after the World Malaria Day, 
our minister came out to support us in our motion and the African Union people also came out to support, to support that motion of eradicating malaria. And it has really, really helped. Though it's very difficult and the traditional way of meeting them, but when we do it as a group and we have a correct timing as in making use of key moments and doing the tweeting very well, the messages go far and beyond. And right now, as I speak, there are a lot of changes happening in Ghana with a lot of building projects on health, a lot of changes being made and it's really, really helpful. So that is how we do the tweeting. It's not an individual thing, as I said earlier. It helps to push the messages. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Like both of you, that emphasis on coming together, working as a group and pushing at the right time just goes to show like how we have to be strategic. And I know we all know that, but just I love how both of you have focused on how identifying key moments in both of your different context has really pushed your agenda and resulted in um, positive results. Um, I have a question online and then once I ask this question I will then open the floor to um, questions from the floor, well questions from the floor. Um, so the first question is from Vicky Burns and this is for Rhoda. She said, um, I mentioned that you are a microbiology student um, and she works at a university in the UK. So she's asking you, Rhoda, do you think that being a student in a relevant area helps you to be an effective campaigner? And how can we encourage more students to recognize their own expertise and become effective campaigners like you? So thank you for the question. I am a microbiologist and we know microbiology is also in relation with health. And I am a person who has always been sitting in the lab and I felt like always sitting in the lab, what can I do to reach out? What can I do to let the voices be heard? It's more about the laboratory work, about the science stuff always in the lab, but then I have to let people know what is actually happening. People getting sick and people going through problems, then we have to advocate so that this side of it will be changed and when it's changed, it will reduce the number of diseases that are occurring in the world. So even in that field, that makes you the right person to also advocate. In the science, it helps you to understand the chemistry, the biology behind these diseases. And so you know your reason for advocacy when you advocate. You know your reason when you are speaking, oh, this and this causes that. And so that is my reason for coming out because I want to effect change. When I effect change, then this will reduce the number of cases that comes in the laboratory. This will reduce the number of diseases and this will reduce the number of deaths. So that is a very strong point for us as, uni or as students or as people in science to even push harder, not just stay in the lab alone, but also come out and let the world know what is really happening on the grounds with these diseases and then we can effect change. Thank you. Just as a follow-up question, what's one tip you would give to a student who has to balance, you know, coursework and all that knowledge that they have and being campaigners, just as a follow-up? Okay, so coursework and... The, the work that we do, we, we are not only in the laboratory, we go out to the field, we go and collect samples. So upon collecting the samples from the people, we are able to tell them, oh, this and this is what is happening. So then you have to leave, right? You have to do this, you have to eat well, and this will help you to build yourself up better. And when they come to know the genesis of what or, or, or everything that happens with the disease, then they are also being pushed to know what we have to do. You also have to help our society. And I have an instance where through my advocacy, I was able to reach out to a lot of youth to tell them that malaria is on the increase. So as youth, we have to be able to keep our surroundings clean. And from there, they were like, how come you are in the lab and also you are trying to advocate for us to push our voices for the government to increase funding and for them to put more resources into malaria? So they, they became motivated because looking at the background I'm coming from and deciding to come out also to talk to them, it was really encouraging for them. So now it's not an individual thing in the community. It's, it's a unison, it's a group of people, a group of youth who are being pushed to bring out our voices so that the government can effect change and help malaria eradication in the country at large. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you so much. Um, so I've abused most of my privileges. I'm gonna um, uh, pass it to the floor if anybody has a question that would be great and then we can come back to some of the questions that we've just got in the chat box um, during this time. 
So you can unmute yourself and ask the question if you have any. I can see that Keisha and Tiffany have just put some nice questions in the chat box. So maybe one of you wants to unmute and ask that out loud. That would be nice to hear from people. Okay, I'll unmute and put my video on for a moment. Uh, I was just going to ask, um, so I work in uh, research around person-centered care of my sort of day job and I wondered about and I was interested in your telling people stories about their experiences of healthcare is that something you kind of create a space for and do you find it's an effective part of campaigning? Who would you like to answer that question first, Tiffany? Either, either Rahab or Rida? Um, I, I don't mind, I suppose. <laughs> okay. we'll, we'll, we'll pass it to Rahab. Do you, Rahab, did you get the question? I put it in the chat as well. Yes, I can actually see it in the, um, the chat, chat box. box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We do have spaces for people to share their stories as healthcare workers. In our grassroots training, which is something I was just, I just finalized a three day campaign advocacy meeting in one of the rural areas out of Nairobi. And um, people tend to call me a doctor. I'm not a doctor, I'm a public health person. But I tell them because I'm able to relate with the local community because I also live in a village. So like what uh, Rhoda was saying, you want, you have been in this place, now you're a programmer, but how do you relate with the issues in the community? For example, when I talked about Septrin Stockout, Nevera Pain Stockout, somebody wrote a note, because we still have um, stigma on people who have TV and HIV. Somebody passed me a note and said, it is true we are experiencing the stockouts. We have not had time to speak about it because we fear to be reprimanded by government, the county government and all that. But when you bring the people who live in the community, the doctors, the real doctors, you know, like medical people, they are able to relate. And these are very powerful stories. In fact, some of the grassroots people we engage are retired nurses and clinic officers. And they are able to now work. So when we have left the area, these grassroots, our very strong grassroots advocates are able now to be left there and relate and help to bring down some of these ailments, minor ailments that really affect our community, even issues of malnutrition. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, would Keisha like to ask her question or? or wait, yes. Wait. Hello. Hello there. Hi. So my question is to Rhoda. Um, so thank you so much for your compelling, obviously, story and for everything that you are doing. Um, so my uncle actually lives in Kumasi, so in Ghana. And uh, you're talking about this sort of, I guess, COVID inertia that people face. So he has typhoid fevers. He managed to contract typhoid. And um, he actually... Um, you know, was one of those people who ref actively refused to go to the hospital and sort of hired a, a, a home nurse who, of course, you know, of course they can take care, but you can't really, you know, do scans, ECGs, etc. All that's really needed. Um, so, yes, us campaigners could, of, of course, like um, persuade the government and campaign and advocate for more funding. However, ultimately, if the people um have this sort of fear of contracting covid so they don't even want to go in to get treatments what do you think we can do as campaigners to help um reduce that sort of fear amongst people okay thank you keisha for the question so what we do as campaigners and um, in the era of COVID 19 when it was at its initial stages um, I did a qualitative survey and I asked them questions. So upon doing that survey and asking them what they think about COVID-19, 
and coupled with malaria, people came out that because of the fear of them getting infected, they don't want to go to the hospital. So what I did was to advise them that they shouldn't have any fear. They just have to practice the safety precautions, putting on the mask, practicing social distancing when going to the hospital. And in course of that, or in the course of doing that in my community, a lot of people change that perception. So as campaigners, we also have to go all out. It's not just about voicing out. When we do the community outreach, we do the community engagement. We also talk about malaria and other diseases that they can help fight against. It's not just about we voicing out. That is our main motive, that the government and we getting people to support and help in the eradication of neglected tropical diseases and all other diseases. We also do encourage them to keep their surroundings clean, to practice social distancing, to do personal hygiene. And it's, it's been doing a lot. My vicinity is a very big example and people are changing in my vicinity. So as campaigners, as I said, we, we have the privilege, we have the one-on-one -on -one chance to talk with them. So we can make or we can effect both changes by talking to them and helping them to know that's fine, the disease is there, but going to the hospital is the key thing to do in order to be safe and to get your health back. Thank you. Thank you, I definitely agree. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to ask, Jill, would you like to ask your question? Uh, just on mute. Um, hi, both of you. This is a question for both of you. We've been campaigning to try and get our government to commit money to the um, Global Fund COVID-19 Emergency Response Fund. And I'm wondering if you've um, seen any of that money yet? Um, and if so, can you give us some practical examples of how it's helped? Okay, yes. Yeah. So Kenya has been a recipient of a separate two grants for COVID-19 through Global Fund. And when we, so in March we had a lockdown because COVID-19 had uh, infections they were rising. So everybody was told go home, road were cl roads were closed, shops were closed, everything came to a standstill. What happened, TB programs, malaria programs, HIV programs were affected. Anybody who needed replenishment for the next one month, because that's when the replenishments are given for HIV and for TB within two months, they had to stay home. And uh, so the statistics at the national level started coming down and we got to a point where we also experienced a number of TB patients who died, some who are even very strong advocates, people died. And that's when now when COVID-19 came, the funding came, we were able now to advocate further and say, as much as they are going to give money to the national level, communities need to be supported. The same way Global Fund supports community in implementing active, uh, active community interventions for the three diseases. So we have been supported with PPEs for community health workers. We have been supported with uh, gloves. We have been supported with um, additional financing to facilitate a community health worker to move from point A to B. And the dis distances are long. I tell you, I drove, I went to one of the counties called Kitui. I drove for two hours before I got to a health facility where TB treatment is given. I told those community health workers they do a tremendous job to trace TB defaulters because TB has its own complexity, it still has its own stigma, and the side effects of the drugs are still very, uh, very, very so much experienced by people, especially for MDR, multi drug resistant TB patients. But uh, I want to say that in the next grant, which starts next year, Kenya has proposed we do away with the 60 injections for MDR patients and introduce the injection free regimen for MDR patients. So Right now, we were in a call yesterday and we are now being asked to plan now for the next second round of Global Fund grants for supporting COVID-19. Just to mention again, this is a separate grant from what Global Fund gave initially. So we appreciate the tremendous support. And I think that's why now we are seeing the numbers of uh, TB patients uh, accessing treatment more and uh, people getting replenishment. And now things are getting back to normal. They are not there but you are getting there. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you so much. We've got one more question um, from Amos that I'm giving to Rahab. And um, Amos, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Eliza. And thanks for both speakers for joining us on this call today. So my question to Rahab is what informs or how do you define the metrics of success for your campaigns, both or online and offline? And further to that, what informs that process? Because um, in terms of context, I'm from Kenya by heritage, and I'm fully aware of the difficulties of navigating that political environment. So I'd be keen to understand, as a member of the civic society, um, how do you kind of define what metrics of success you will use, and how do you track that over a different period of time in relation to different campaigns? Thank you. Thank you, Amos, for your very difficult and good question. <laughs> difficult because, you know, advocacy campaigns, not everything succeeds, but there are various levels of success. One is if you do a success and it gets attention of whoever you are addressing to, like a formal response, or you find like we have daily COVID-19 briefings, it, an issue being brought up of TB, that people need to go for TB testing, people need to continue TB treatment, that is one success. However, some of the call to action we usually have is that we want to see like drugs in facility. That may take time because maybe they are like KEMSA, the Kenya Medical Supply Agency, government supply agency has said, we don't have drugs anyway in the store. So that takes time for it to be procured and maybe airlifted. So it depends with the issue you want to brought out. If it's an issue like, um, you want people to stop being harassed by police? That one was instant. When we started, we, I think there was a lot of media outcry and we also did a lot of letters to government saying, you cannot treat this pandemic like we are at war. This is public health. So beating people and all that doesn't work. And the president came out and said, any police doing those things, they are on their own. And that stopped. And I think that was has even encouraged other people to access facilities. So it depends with uh, the call to action. It can be immediate, you want to see an immediate thing, like in two days, we don't want to see this. It can also be a long time, like three months. Right now we are waiting for drugs, which we were told would come in October, so we are waiting. In October, if it's not there, we'll still continue the campaign until we realize it. Yeah, I hope I've been able to explain, but sometimes, I just want to say that sometimes you may not realize what you want, but it, you, should not, you should not give up. You should now uh, take a back seat evaluate, plan again. If it's important to the citizens you are trying to support, plan again and make sure you do it again. We should not give up. Like septrin has taken so long from last year and yet we still don't have septrin in the hospitals. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your response. Then yeah, definitely do not give up. Thank you so, so much, both Rahab, Rhoda and all the brilliant questions that we got from everybody. I, I want to really focus on uh, Rahab's last words on us not giving up because that is the theme of this conference of hopeful campaigning in difficult times. And it's just been amazing to hear how both of you have pushed on and found different opportunities and been strategic. And I think that focus on you know sitting back reflecting assessing what the situation is and moving forward is something that we've all done in various ways but we've been really really lucky to hear from you both you Rhoda and Rahab about how you've done it and how it's worked out um, and how we can track success that I think is an even bigger question that we can continuously have over WhatsApp, social media, and different ways of communicating, because that's something that we'll definitely need to continue working on as we become more and more used to working in this new reality. So um, thank you so much for your, for, for your insights, for sharing your wonderful experiences. And I am closing out the session because I've kind of overrun and I've stolen at least a minute of the break time but i really want to thank everybody for attending this wonderful session um, it's been amazing um before we leave we have a music video that we're going to play as we leave the session so imagine you're leaving the room 
um, the conference room and they're playing a music video as you're getting your teas and coffees. It's called Win This Way, which is a zero malaria campaign song that um, the campaigns manager for the Youth Leaders for Health project, Pushpana Krishnamurthy, helped coordinate. And it's it's a really great song which brings together artists and instruments from all over the world, especially like South Africa and India and just like this fusion where you're extolling the virtues of the need for a strong health system and the need to tackle um, malaria around the world. So I'm going to pass over to the tech person who will facilitate this musical interlude and thank you everybody again. And also, we come back from break at 12.30. So, yeah, get your teas and coffees and we'll be back at 12.30. Thank you.